Hey y'all, it's Denise Hubble here, respiratory therapist chatting about the urinary system, also known as the renal system and also known as the kidneys. Um, I find it a very interesting topic because many of the patients we deal with have chronic renal failure or acute renal failure and this results with a building up of fluid in their bodies typically and lots of consequences of that. So if we learn about the anatomy and the physiology, it'll help us understand about the pathophysiologies that our patients have. All right, let's look at the functions of the urinary system. Um, as it mentions here, the kidneys need to eliminate waste products that are listed here, including drugs. Um, and some of the other regulatory functions are listed here. Production of renin, we're gonna be talking about the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway a little later in this lection, lecture. And we're gonna be talking about erythropoietin, very important and uh, the conversion of vitamin D. But one thing we need to add here, also the kidneys perform a function in regulation of pH. We will be studying that more, but that's an important thing to add to our notes. The urinary system is composed of two kidneys, two ureters, one urinary bladder, and one urethra. Here we see the two kidneys. They are retroperitoneal, so they're behind the peritoneum. And we notice that the right kidney is a little lower than the left because it's getting crowded by the, the liver. Also, each kidney has an adrenal gland on top of it, which is part of the endocrine system. So we'll we will be chatting about that in this section. Um, we also see that there are two ureters. They're the yellow tracts coming down and they are delivering urine to the bladder where it's going to be stored until it is secreted out of the body by the urethra. Minor calluses collect urine and dump it into major calluses, which then dump urine into the renal pelvis, which we think of as kind of a funnel shape. So the renal pelvis is where the urine finally will all collect from all of the areas of the kidney. Oh, this is a great image. On the very outside of the kidney, there would be a renal capsule. And then right inside that renal capsule, we would have this lighter, area known as the renal cortex, the outer portion of the kidney. And then inside of that, we have the renal medulla, the sort of more inside part of that. And the innermost part of the kidney is gonna be the renal pel pelvis. Also shown here are the minor calyx and the major calyx. So the minor would be smaller and they dump urine into the major calyx, which then dumps urine into the renal pelvis. Also shown here are the renal pyramids kind of a darker pink color, we see those. They are they make up most of the renal medulla. This image shows all those structures again really well. And it also shows that the kidney is well supplied by blood. So the vessels coming into the kidney are all arteries and the vessels leaving the kidney are veins. Um, the arteries are shown in red, the veins are shown in blue. We do not need to memorize some of these terms, interlobar and arcuate, for example, and cortical. I will not be testing on those fine details, but the other terms are important. The nephrons are the working units of the kidney. They're the area where urine is actually made. So it's important for us to study them very well and how they work, and that's what the next section discusses. So now we're gonna look at the nephrons, the working units of the kidney. So they're shown in the right-hand side of this image in pale pink. And the first one we're gonna talk is the, about is the cortical nephron. We see that it stays within the renal cortex, hence the name cortical nephron, and it is the most common type of nephron that we have. There's another type of nephron that a portion of it dips down into the renal medulla, and it is called the juxtamedullary nephron. They're not as prevalent, but we still have some of those. Either way, these nephrons are gonna produce urine and dump the urine into collecting ducts. And those collecting ducts are then gonna dump the urine into the minor calyx and then into the major calyx 
and then into the renal pelvis. You may have seen a grandmother making blackberry jelly in your past. Um, I hope you did because the this part of the kidney actually acts a lot like the way that our grandmothers made blackberry jelly. When you make blackberry jelly, you put all of the pulp and the juice of the blackberry into this jelly bag that's very porous. It's also known as cheesecloth. And so you put everything in that really porous bag. And then you twist the top of the bag and you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze in order to get the liquids out and maybe some small particles are going to come out as well. Well, I tell you the story because this is exactly how the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule work in the nephron. So the glomerulus is this knot of capillaries or vessels that are extremely porous, just like the cheesecloth I described. And what happens is a lot of pressure builds up in these capillaries and they're very porous. So it probably is logical to you that a lot of fluid leaves these capillaries and small particles will leave as well. But any big particles like proteins and blood cells should stay behind and not come out of the glomerulus. When all of this fluid and small particles come out of the glomerulus, they get caught by something called the Bowman's capsule, which I kind of think of as like a ball mitt. So it actually is ready to capture all of the fluid and small particles that have been dumped out. So the Bowman's capsule captures all of this. In fact, on any given day, the amount of um, liquids and small particles that leave the glomerulus is about 180 liters, which sounds crazy but um, a lot of fluid and small particles transfer across this area. Of course, most of this has to come back to the blood. In fact, about 99% of this is all going to return to the blood in the following processes that we're going to study about. So we know then the glomerulus has to be very leaky and it has higher pressures than most capillary beds. Um, the anatomy of it is described here with these podocytes that are involved and we have filtration slits which is a very porous area that allows a lot of filtration to occur. The really interesting thing I want to point out in this image is we see that the afferent arteriole brings blood into the glomerulus and the efferent carries blood away. But we also notice that the afferent arteriole is larger than the efferent. This increases the pressures inside the glomerulus so that they are higher than most normal capillary beds. This promotes filtration. So here we see a good image of the nephron. We see that um, in the right hand middle section of the image, blood is entering the capillary bed known as the glomerulus. It's entering through the afferent arteriole and leaving through the efferent arteriole. We know that a great deal of filtrate is being produced by the glomerulus and the, the glomerular capillaries. Um, this material is basically water in small particles. Pretty rough system. It's called filtration. It produces filtrate. Getting picked up by the Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. Then that filtrate is traveling through a wiggly area that's close by. So we call that the proximal convoluted tubule. And then that filtrate travels along. This looks like a maze in this image, but it travels along and goes down into an area called the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle has two sides the descending and the ascending side. Really easy to remember. So first it goes to the descending loop of Henle and then through the ascending loop of Henle and then again through the sort of wiggly area and it's far away from the Bowman's capsule so we call it distal convoluted tubule so it's named it very well and then dumps into the collecting duct. Also we notice that there are capillaries all around this structure because we're going to learn that there's interaction here of materials going back and forth from the filtrate to the blood. So let's learn all about that. Notice the cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. These cells can release renin in response to low blood pressure. This is a bit of a review from the previous slide. I actually prefer this image a little bit more than the previous image, so let's chat about this one as well. The afferent arteriole brings blood into the glomerulus. Filtration occurs here and solutes that are small and water come out of the glomerulus and are captured by the Bowman's capsule. Now it's called filtrate. The blood that entered the glomerulus exits through the efferent arteriole. And also um, pointed out here are the proximal convoluted tubule, 
We also have the descending loop of Henle and the ascending loop of Henle. I want to add here that when we look at the loop of Henle, it has thin portions and thick portions. So it's good to know that you can have, uh, for example, a thin portion of the ascending loop of Henle and a thick portion of the ascending loop of Henle. That's kind of good to know because later when you learn about drugs, there may be a reference to a drug working on the thick portion of the ascending loop of Henle, and now you'll know where that is. Anyway, after we leave the loop of Henle, we get into the distal convoluted tubule and then into the collecting ducts. And just as I'd mentioned in the previous slide, uh, there's vasculature all around this, blood vessels basically all around this um, tubule system, so that there can be communication back and forth between filtrate and blood. This is a great schematic of how urine is produced. So we know there are three steps, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. We've talked a bit about glomerular filtration and how it's sort of a rough process, almost like draining craft dinner in a colander, for example. Where you're gonna get water and small bits of particles that, that filter out and create something that we call filtrate. It's, um, shown here in the glomerular capillaries, number one, where filtrate is produced. Number two, tubular re reabsorption. This is the process of materials being taken out of filtrate and put back into blood. These are going to be good items that we want to keep. Things like water, glucose, amino acids, and some ions, like it mentions. So tubular reabsorption. Things are getting reabsorbed from the tubules back into blood. And then the last one, shown in number three, tubular secretion. This is secreting stuff from the blood into the filtrate. These would be things we don't want in the body, like excess hydrogen ions, potassium, creatinine, and some drugs, as it mentions. So tubular secretion going from filtrate, pardon me, going from blood out into the filtrate. These are things that we don't want to have. Many of our patients suffer from hypotension or low blood pressure. For example, maybe you have a patient with a blood pressure of 70 over 50, that's low. When the blood pressure is low, there's going to be little or no filtrate made. So then there's going to be little to no urine produced. So it's very interesting that you can notice that in your patients with low blood pressure, that they'll have very little urine or possibly no urine. The tubule cells line the renal tubule. These cells are very well designed to recognize items that are in the filtrate and pull them back into the blood and save them or reclaim them. These will be good items like water and glucose, amino acids. This is called tubular reabsorption. Those same tubule cells can also have the function of tubular secretion, which is just the opposite of reabsorption. Secretion is when we want to get rid of some products by taking them from the blood and passing them out to the filtrate. Let's try to make this image simple. We're looking at a nephron. Let's start off by looking at the green arrows. We're looking at secretion, the idea of getting rid of things we don't want by taking them from the blood and putting them into the filtrate so that they are going to be urine and we'll get rid of them from the body. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, we'll see that some drugs and poisons and hydrogen ions can be secreted here into the filtrate. Also in the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting ducts, potassium can be secreted here so that we can get rid of potassium. In red arrows and blue arrows, we see items that are reabsorbed. For example, in the proximal convoluted tubule, we see numerous things reabsorbed. And also in the uh, loop of Henle and in the distal convoluted tubule and again in the collecting ducts, lots of reabsorption happening. Nitrogenous wastes need to be eliminated from the body. Examples so listed here like urea and creatinine. These things we expect the kidney to be able to uh, rid our body of. If we have renal failure, we're going to have a buildup of these types of things. And in fact, in patients in the ICU, blood work is done every day on these patients typically, 
And if there's any hint of renal failure, certainly urea and creatinine will be looked at in the blood work. They will typically be climbing in the face of renal failure. It is important to note that we would not expect to see things like blood or um, big proteins, for example, in urine. This is actually an abnormal finding, um, and it indicates that the kidneys are not working properly. We all know that the bladder can stretch to hold more urine. This is because it has transitional epithelium, which allows stretch, and it has some layers of muscle. Uh, fortunately, the bladder has two sphincters, which are muscle bands that um, can tighten around the urethra. The internal urethral sphincter is involuntary. That means we don't have control over it. Thank goodness we have an additional sphincter called the external urethral sphincter, which is voluntary. That means we have control over that and can, for the most part, control when urination happens. A Foley catheter can be inserted into the bladder. Um, it's basically a tube that goes into the bladder with a bulb on the end, and it is designed to allow drainage and collection of urine from the bladder and into a canister that has graduations on it, so the amount of urine produced by the patient can be measured. The kidneys work very hard to maintain a normal blood pH, maintain a normal amount of water and electrolytes in our body. Let's take a look at the breakdown of where water is in our body and some terminology that, that we use. Intracellular fluid means what it sounds like, intra, inside of our cells, all of that fluid. So this is most of our water in our body is inside of our cells. So of course less of it is outside of our cells in the extracellular fluid. So just looking at where water is in our body, and we're just kind of talking about an average adult here might have about 40 liters of total water, and that would make up 60% of their weight. Um, so we know already that most water is inside of cells, so intracellular, and that's shown here in tan color, and then some is extracellular fluid, shown in blue, and some is in the blood, known as plasma volume, and that's shown in pink. It is termed extracellular fluid as well, but specifically it's also plasma. What a great overview this is of how uh, water and ions, for example, are moving around our body. So let's start on the left and look at the lungs. I think this is probably the most straightforward. We see that oxygen comes in through our lungs, is delivered by blood plasma to interstitial fluid by our cells, and taken up by our cells, of course, for metabolism. Inside the cells, metabolism is occurring and producing CO2. Therefore, the next set of arrows shows CO2 going out, diffusing into interstitial fluid, which then moves to blood plasma and is excreted by the lungs. In the GI tract, we see that nutrients are absorbed and make their way via the blood all the way to our cells. And also we see movement of water. Water comes in, water and ions, through the GI tract, and um, much of that water makes its way to the cells. Um, also, we see the kidneys here on the far right dealing with water, ions, and nitrogenous wastes. If a patient takes in two liters of water over the course of 24 hours and only eliminates one liter of water in that same 24 hour period, we would call them one liter fluid positive. That means they're retaining fluid. Um, on the other hand, if they've been given a drug such as Lasix, which is a loop diuretic, that encourages diuresis or urine output. So a patient that has received Lasix, maybe in the last 24 hours, they have had maybe four liters of urine output and they maybe only took in let's say two liters of fluid in that 24-hour period they would be termed negative two liters fluid balance for the previous 24 hours so i just introduced that because we actually do keep track of this balance of ins and outs we would call that
Also an important point in this slide is the idea that one of our very important ways of managing our fluid balance in our body is this thirst feeling that we have. Um, we, we have sensors in our brain called osmoreceptors that are very, very sensitive. And they are able to detect when our concentration of salts are too high compared to water. And this alerts us that we're thirsty. And it's a very strong, strong sensation. Here we have a breakdown of where most of us get our fluids. On the left, showing where we get our fluids. On the right, how we lose our fluids. So, just building on the idea of monitoring ins and outs of a patient. In would be all the fluid that they take in, that may be uh, all written down and recorded. And then out would also be um, written down how they lost their fluid. So we can track urine output by using the Foley catheter in place in a collection chamber. The other ways aren't as easy to detect. In fact, we often can't keep track of those. Um, but we use the system to sort of calculate how much the patient's fluid balance is. This looks like a bit of a complicated pathway, but it's actually pretty simple. As I mentioned before, we have the osmoreceptors in our hypothalamus, which can detect when um, some of our salts are higher in our body. And um, this actually causes us to want to have a drink, and this increases our water in our body, dilutes out the salts, and corrects the initial problem. So it's a negative feedback mechanism. Antidiuretic hormone is produced by the hypothalamus, but stored in the posterior pituitary. If the osmolarity of the blood increases or blood volume decreases, ADH will be released. ADH targets the kidneys collecting ducts, as it says here, and causes more sodium to be reabsorbed from the filtrate to the blood. And we know that water follows salt, so when the sodium is reabsorbed, water will follow which means that we'll have more blood volume, less urine output. There are some specialized cells in the kidney called macula densa cells. What macula densa cells do is that if blood pressure is low in this area, um, they release an enzyme called renin. And renin gets involved with this kind of complex pathway called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway. Um, what it results in is something called angiotensin II. And angiotensin II causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, of course, and the release of aldosterone. This vasoconstriction increases blood pressure, and aldosterone increases blood volume, as we'll see in the next slide. So in this way, we're correcting the low blood pressure. Aldosterone has an effect on the tubule cells. It makes the tubule cells reabsorb more sodium. So sodium is going to move from the filtrate back into the blood, and then we know that water follows salt, so water is also going to move into the blood from the filtrate. And this way we'll retain fluid and improve our blood pressure and blood volume. Also noted here is a little bit about the shifting of ions. So for each sodium ion that gets reabsorbed in this case, a chloride ion also follows along and a potassium ion is secreted out into the filtrate. What a great slide. Let's start on the far right. Um, we're going to acknowledge that we have falling blood volume or pressure and perhaps increased osmolarity as well of our blood. This results in um, the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus noticing this change. That causes the posterior pituitary to release antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone moves down along to the kidneys. It actually moves throughout the body, but it has an impact in the kidneys specifically in the collecting ducts. Sodium will be reabsorbed and water will follow. This should increase our blood pressure and our blood volume. In yellow, in the middle, we see another process where our barrel receptors are gonna notice this falling blood pressure. This causes a sympathetic nervous system impulse to increase and it goes to the systemic arterioles and causes constriction of those. This should increase our peripheral vascular resistance and increase our blood pressure. Also, another system that we've started to talk about is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway. So when we have reduced filtrate volume or solute content in the renal tubules, the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney are going to release something called renin.
And just to back up here a little bit, we need to do a little bit of background work and add a few points to the slide. The liver released something called angiotensinogen into the blood. When the angiotensinogen meets up with this renin that's been released by the kidneys, this causes conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. When the angiotensin 1 now gets exposed to something called ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, which is present in the lungs and some other parts of the body, the angiotensin 1 can now become angiotensin 2. And it's the angiotensin 2 that now is going to have an impact. So now let's take a look again at our slide. Angiotensin 2 is now formed in the blood and we see that it causes vasoconstriction which will increase our peripheral vascular resistance and increase our blood pressure. Also angiotensin 2 affects the adrenal cortex and makes it secrete aldosterone. Aldosterone has an impact on the kidney tubules, causes sodium reabsorption and water is going to follow. This will increase our blood volume and raise our blood pressure. So you can see that we have multiple pathways working to try to correct uh, blood volume problems and they're all working together. Let's review that again, the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. Well, first of all, the liver has produced something called angiotensinogen and it's floating around in the blood. If your blood pressure drops, the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney are going to release renin. Renin causes angiotensinogen to turn into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1, if it's exposed to something called ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, it's going to turn into angiotensin 2. Later, you're going to learn about a drug category called ACE inhibitors, and they actually block the effect of ACE. So they would reduce the um, production of angiotensin 2. Anyhow, that's going to be something I'm sure comes up in your pharmacy courses. So now we have angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 does a couple things. One thing is it causes vasoconstriction of the arterioles and this will increase blood pressure. It also has an impact on the adrenal cortex. It makes the adrenal cortex release aldosterone and aldosterone has an impact on the collecting ducts of the renal tubules. It causes sodium and water reabsorption. This will increase blood volume. The kidneys play a huge role in maintaining normal blood pH. Uh, we know that that should be 7.35 to 7.45 and if you drift above that range then you're considered alkalotic and if you're below you're considered acidotic. So we're going to learn here how the kidneys have an impact on that. We also need to mention that the kidneys work along with the respiratory system and with blood buffers and these three processes all work together kidneys lungs and blood buffers in order to try to maintain this important reaction is going to be seen time and time again let's take a look at this reaction on the left we have co2 it can combine with water to form something called carbonic acid which we see in the middle as h2co3 that can further um, break down and become hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. We see that this entire reaction is a reversible reaction, meaning that it can go in either direction. So let's take a look at what could happen here. Let's say we have a patient who chokes on a piece of steak and is unable to move air in and out of their lungs. We know that metabolism is going to cause the secretion of CO2 in the body. And if we can't breathe it out through our lungs, then we know that the CO2 is going to begin to accumulate in the body. And especially we're going to see that in the blood. And as the CO2 rises in the blood, this reaction is going to be pushed towards the right. So first we're going to have some carbonic acid formed. And then further to the right, we're going to see some hydrogen ions developing, increased hydrogen ions and increased bicarb. It's this free floating hydrogen ions that create our pH level. So if we have more free-floating hydrogen ions, we're going to have a lower pH. That's how that system works. The higher the hydrogen ion uh, concentration, the lower the pH is. So let's review again. We have a patient who has choked on a large piece of steak. They're not moving any air. Metabolism is still occurring in their body. They're accumulating CO2. It's causing this reaction to move towards the right. We're going to have more free-floating hydrogen ions, and that means a lower pH. The previous slide also mentioned that when CO2 climbs, breathing can increase in order to try to blow off that CO2. Well, the kidneys can also work hard to try to make corrections as well. One thing about the kidneys is they, they're very good at correcting pH, but they take time to do that. It takes more time 
Um, so, for example, if blood pH rises, so we become alkalotic, then bicarbonate ions can be excreted by the kidneys and hydrogen ions can be retained by the kidneys to try to correct this um, deviation in blood pH. If pH falls, we become acidotic, and let's, let's be real, this is what actually really happens with our patients most often. We deal with uh, acidosis way more often than alkalosis. So this is what we more commonly see. Acidotic patient with a falling pH, what the kidneys will do is that bicarbonate ions will be reabsorbed and retained by the kidneys. So we'll kind of collect those and hydrogen ions will be secreted to try to get rid of that acid.